Somewhere in Cumbria, in the north of England, an unmarked grave covered with rain-battered teddy bears, tributes and flowers, lies the body of Poppy Worthington. She was a 13-month-old baby girl who deserved so much more than her short life afforded her. For many years, the harrowing circumstances of her death were hidden. The little girl with the gappy baby tooth smile was subjected to a horrific assault by her father, Paul Worthington, that led to her death in December 2012. Now stay tuned till the end where I give my take on why this happened. The specific cause of Poppy's death remains uncertain, but is believed to have been suffocation or cardiac arrest as a result of an assault. Today, Mr. Worthington, who is a 48-year-old supermarket worker, believed to have committed the most monstrous of crimes, remains a free man. He is now said to have gone into hiding. There was hope for Poppy's grieving family when the Crown Prosecution Service said it was reviewing its decision not to press charges. There is to be a fresh inquest and a date is to be determined. Meanwhile, little Poppy sleeps on. This is her story and it raises profound and disturbing questions about the role of police and social services and the cloak of secrecy that has concerned their fatal mistakes until now. Poppy's mother said her relationship with Paul Worthington started about 2009, at which time she already had three daughters living with her. She and Paul had a son together, and then twins, and then in October 2011, Poppy was born. This brought the number of children in the household to six. A few weeks after the birth of the twins, the family moved to a three-bedroom house, which they rented from Tracy Worthington, who is Paul's sister. The family were living in the house at the time of Poppy's death. The mother's relationship with Paul was on and off. Sometimes he was living in the house, sometimes he was not. They decided in December 2012, there was a plan for the family, including Paul, to move to live in another area in order to make a fresh start. The house consisted of a living room and kitchen downstairs, and three bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs. There was a bedroom with a double bed, which the mother shared with Paul, although she said she often slept on a sofa downstairs. There were two cots in that room in which the two boys slept. Poppy slept in a cot in another bedroom, and sometimes one of her sisters slept in that room too. Otherwise, the other girls all slept in the third bedroom. The mother explained that the house was always busy, not only with the six children, but also with a regular stream of visiting family and friends. The mother described Poppy as alert and very sociable, very alive, bubbly, funny. Poppy had an uncomplicated birth. She was developmentally normal and had taken her first steps shortly before her death. She was generally in good health. Her health was more robust than that of her twin brother. Her mother had needed to seek medical attention for Poppy on only a few occasions. In February 2012, when she was about three months old, she had an overnight admission to hospital because of acute bronchiolitis. A little later, there was a diagnosis of conjunctivitis and subsequently Poppy suffered vomiting and diarrhea and she developed a rash and chicken pox was suspected. On December the 11th, 2012, Poppy was a bit snuffly but otherwise well. Her mother put her into her cot in a box room between 7 and 7.30 p.m. By about 8 p.m., all the children were in bed. Poppy's mother watched television downstairs. At about 9 p.m., Mr. Worthington went upstairs with his laptop and went to bed. He checked out some sports results he gambled on. Then he watched porn, which he told police involved adults, before falling asleep. That's a bit of a red flag. Imagine telling someone you watch porn and you have to confirm it was adults. What the fuck else would it be? At 2 a.m., Poppy's mother, who had not yet been to sleep, went upstairs to fetch the laptop for her own use. Mr. Worthington gave his own version of events that night, which the judge found unconvincing. He claimed he was woken in the early hours by a scream or cry from Poppy. When he went into her room, he says he found her rigid and stiff. He gave her a cuddle and took her into his room and laid her on the bed crossways. He fetched a clean diaper from downstairs but did not change her and got back into bed. After a few minutes, he says he put out his hand and touched Poppy and discovered that she had gone limp. 
he ran downstairs with her and called out to Poppy's mother to get an ambulance. She called 999 at 5.56am and an ambulance arrived at 6.05am. The paramedics described Poppy as being very pale, waxy and obviously not breathing. In the ambulance, the cardiac monitor showed that Poppy's heart was not beating. On the way to the hospital, both the paramedic and Poppy's father tried to revive her. She arrived at 6.11am. Poppy was taken immediately to the resuscitation room. Dr. Bremer was the locum consultant pediatrician, who took the lead in treating Poppy when she arrived at the hospital. He said that on arrival, Poppy had no heart rate, was blue and cold, and was not breathing. Her pupils were fixed and dilated. Poppy was laid on a resuscitation bed, and around 10 different professionals undertook the standard resuscitation procedures for 57 minutes. The doctor stated that the anesthetist tried to intubate unsuccessfully and then he took over and intubated with the size 4.5mm endotracheal tube. Drugs were given through a venous access and blood samples were taken. He said that Poppy did not produce a detectable heart rate at any stage and basically she was dead before she arrived at the hospital. Now I have a very important statement from the mother which gives away everything, but again, wait till the end. After 57 minutes of effort and speaking to the parents, resuscitation was discontinued and at 7.07, .07, Poppy was pronounced dead. Her body was moved to the children's ward before being taken to the mortuary around midday. At 9.40 a.m., a crime scene investigator attended and took photographs and a video of the house. At 10.15 a.m., a female officer named in the report only as Inspector S., and later identified as Amanda Sadler, attended hospital with a colleague and inspected Poppy's body. They noticed some blood trickling down her leg when her tiny body was moved. Poppy's mother and father were spoken to by police at the hospital. During the course of the morning, Paul was permitted to visit the toilet where he could have washed away any crucial DNA that would have helped being a criminal case against him. And swabs were not taken from him until later in the afternoon. Amid the drama, potentially crucial evidence was lost. The gloves the paramedic who carried Poppy into the ambulance was wearing were thrown away. The stretcher sheet, which had blood and other bodily fluids on it and which might have yielded critical clues, was not preserved. One officer saw a used diaper on the floor near the fireplace in the house. It was believed to be the last diaper worn by Poppy. Her paternal aunt, put it in the bin, but it was never retrieved. Other items not preserved for forensic analysis included Poppy's pillow, her clothing, her parents' bedsheet, or any items that might have been used as part of the assault. Even Paul's laptop went missing. The scene at the house was not secured and no reconstruction with the parents took place. Now you all watch true crime videos, right? Many times in these videos, uh, the police will ransack the house looking for evidence. What I've just told you, how there was no DNA, um, buccal swabs or whatever, they didn't take any of the pillows, the location where she died, is pure incompetence on part of the police. Now, at a meeting held by Cumbria County Council on the day of Poppy's death, a pediatrician with responsibility for safeguarding of children said Poppy suffered from chronic constipation and this may have accounted for the blood coming from the top of her legs. But this was totally wrong. She did not suffer from constipation. It was accepted as fact at the time and probably had a bearing on many important decisions that followed. But of course, that would be the thinking. They are going to think it's constipation because of course, there was no other evidence collected, right? Her body was transferred to the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital on December the 14th and an x-ray revealed two broken bones in one of her legs. Mr. Justice Jackson concluded that in the absence of any proper investigation into the injury, its cause could not be determined. Common sense might dictate that this might have given cause for concern about the five children, then aged between 13 months and eight, remaining in the care of Mr. Worthington and Poppy's mother. But it was four weeks after Poppy's death before they were examined by doctors, although no sign of injury was found. No x-rays were taken. Experts said, Poppy's injuries would have caused significant pain that would have been apparent to the parents. But of course, if a child has a broken leg, a parent would notice. But both the mother and Paul denied knowing anything about them.
Two pathologists, Dr. Alison Armour and Dr. Stephanie Vitetti, were instructed by the coroner to examine Poppy's body. Because of other commitments, this didn't take place until five days after her death. Dr. Armour was deeply concerned to find bruising and tearing, and the next day rang Amanda Sadler to express concerns that Poppy had been subjected to a penetrative act. Wow. Despite the extreme gravity of the charge, another officer, Mike Forrester, would not permit even basic tests to be conducted, refusing to authorise forensic testing of any samples or items seized apart from Poppy's blood. On the 24th of December, Dr. Armour again phoned Sadler to say that she believed Poppy did not die from natural causes, but as a result of an unlawful act. Despite these concerns, Dr. Armour did not complete her report into Poppy's death until six months later. Six months? What were you doing for six months? Picking your ass? She explained that in a case of such seriousness, she wanted to have all the laboratory results before making an official finding. Normally, pathologists provide preliminary findings to the coroner. Dr. Bittetti, whose report was not filed until July, but who had filed an interim one in February, found no evidence of death by natural causes, such as a seizure or metabolic disease, in her report either. Poppy's body was released by the coroner and she was buried on February the 19th, 2013. So, so far, right, despite the lack of evidence they gathered from the house, the doctors, the coroner's office, they felt like this was not natural. Somebody did this to her. Now, in 2013, Michael Scarborough of Forensics was instructed by the police to carry out forensic tests. He found that Poppy's DNA was present on an intimate part of Mr. Worthington's body. This was identified from the swab taken on the afternoon of the day Poppy died, although not to the degree that might have been expected that he had committed an unlawful act, and it was noted that this could have been the result of secondary transfer, in other words, from his hands to his pee-pee during urination. And it was later that they realised that they did take a buccal swab, they just didn't act upon it in this manner. Paul could have washed away incriminating evidence in the hours after Poppy's death. Despite the clear suggestion of a sexual assault, Cumbria Constabulary found to use a pediatrician with specialist knowledge of investigating sexual abuse. Virtually nothing was done to protect Poppy's three sisters and two brothers after her death. The council simply asked Poppy's grandparents and mother to supervise Mr. Worthington's contact with the children. This continued even after 2013, when Poppy's parents separated for a time and Paul moved out. On August 2nd, social services became aware that Paul had moved back into the family home. A polite letter was written to the family asking that unsupervised contact between father and children should not be permitted. Having considered the various reports, police arrested Paul and Poppy's mother on August 27th, 2013 and placed them on bail. The mother was to have no unsupervised contact with the child and the father was to have no contact with the child under 13. They were interviewed and papers relating to the case were sent to the prosecution service. In September, the council became aware the mother was having unsupervised contact with her children. Two months later, the children were finally removed from the house and put into foster care. Wow, that's so sad. Well, what's that like? Five kids now gone into foster care? Hopefully they're safe. On March 28, 2014, a two-week fact-finding hearing was held at the High Court in London, at which all available evidence was heard. Justice Peter Jackson found in his judgment that Poppy died as a result of a penetrative assault inflicted upon by her father and criticised police, social workers and the coroner. Following Justice Jackson's findings, police officers involved in the case were removed and replaced the Independent Police Complaints Commission began an investigation. Full details of the circumstances surrounding a death are usually given at an inquest. But at Poppy's inquest, held by Coroner Ian Smith on October 21, no details were forthcoming. It took place nearly three years after her death, delayed possibly as a result of the police's investigation. But when they finally did have the inquest, it lasted just seven minutes. On January the 14th, 2015, Cumbria's new coroner, David Roberts, perhaps dissatisfied by the lack of information at the first one, requested a fresh inquest. Of course, I mean, what can he say in seven minutes? On the instructions of the National Crime Agency, 
pathologist Dr. Nathaniel Carey examined Poppy's case. In December 2014, he suggested she might have died from a hemorrhage caused by infection. Justice Jackson rejected this theory. There was compelling evidence to support the sexual assault allegation. On January 16, 2015, the CPS said there was insufficient evidence to bring criminal charges. They'd given up on justice for Poppy. And on the 31st of March 2015, Justice Jackson disclosed that Poppy's father, Paul Worthington, who must have been pleased by Dr. Carey's infection theory, had requested another family court fact-finding hearing. Presumably, he must have hoped it could clear his name. Eight months later, on November the 11th, Justice Jackson ordered a new fact-finding hearing to be held in Liverpool that month. It took place over five days and substantial cost to the taxpayer. Journalists were allowed, but not the public. Justice Jackson found that Poppy was subjected to sexual assault by her father, which led to her death, and it was made public more than three years after her death and 21 months after the report was first drawn up. I mean, if you take Poppy, a little girl who died in incomprehensible circumstances could have got justice. The same inquest also heard Poppy suffocated in the family home, as she slept next to her father in an unsafe sleeping environment. Now, before I give you the statement at the end, which confirms to me what actually happened, right? Let me go over what happened, right? So the family's home was not secure and Poppy's last diaper she wore was lost despite all the presence of the police officer at the house, right? And that would have given them a lot of evidence. Is there any blood on the diaper, etc, etc, right? Furthermore, the senior investigating officer of this case did not visit the home. There was no reconstruction with the parents at home so that their accounts could be understood and investigations focused. There was very little or no forensic medical examination at the time of the death. Swabs were not taken until post-mortem despite delays, meaning forensic analysis can be prejudiced. The initial views of pathologist Dr. Allison, who conducted the post-mortem, were not clearly passed on to the local authority for safeguarding purposes. Neither parents' phones were analysed. Samples that had been taken were not sent for analysis until after the full post-mortem receipt. No statements were taken from paramedics, nurses, doctors and families until September 2013. So, this is what I think happened. Let me read this out to you, right? Kelly Grieve, she was a clinical support worker and she said it was her role to care for the parents while they were at the hospital, right? Now, she met the ambulance and she saw Paul. He was wearing a t-shirt and jeans. He had his socks and shoes with him and he put those in the relative's room. At a later stage, when mother and the police officer were also present in the room, the parents spoke to her about what had happened. The next morning she recorded her notes and the mother started telling her that all the kids had been sick. And then the dad said to her, right, this is what the, this is Paul's, uh, I guess you could say unofficial statement, right? Because this is to a hospital worker and not the police. He said, that she woke up in her cot, she was crying, so he put her in bed with him. He tried to give Poppy her pacifier, but she wouldn't have it. When he was asked to clarify whether Paul had said in bed or on the bed, he said it was next to him, so she was in bed with him. The mother also told the worker that Poppy was making a face like she needed a poo. So Paul put his fingers on each side of her diaper to try and see if the nappy was full or if she had already pooped, right? See, um, just basically trying to help her poop, right? Then he said he went downstairs to get a diaper because he noticed that it started to smell and he figured, okay, she probably has pooped, right? I'm a parent, I've been there. He also said she was still crying when he was going downstairs. Paul told the mother that Poppy was up and finding it hard to poo. He said, I don't know why, but I looked over to Poppy and touched her arm and it was lifeless. So he ran downstairs shouting, Poppy, Poppy. What do you make of this? Let me explain it to you, right? Those were the official statements. Well, I guess unofficial, but let me explain it. So she needs to poo. He's not sure if she pooped. Maybe she has because he can, can smell it, right? He runs downstairs. He comes upstairs and he's like, oh no, she's died. I think what's happened is that either he was trying to sleep or he was on his phone one or the other. She woke him up, right? He got pissed off. I think he gave her a whack. Yeah, he's half asleep or again, he's on his phone. Man's gambling and on porn. 
You know what that can do to the brain, the dirty bastard, right? So I think he was just annoyed and in a rage, he gave her a whack. And it must have been some whack for her to have broken her leg. Although there were some reports that her leg was broken previously. But then that doesn't make sense because the parents would have known. I mean, when a child breaks their leg, they're in agony, right? So either the parents are so stupid and so bad that they let the child walk around with a broken bone or he did it then. That's when he ran downstairs, got the diaper, come upstairs and he realized, oh no, what's happened, right? Like maybe he, the whack was on her head or something. That's my theory, right? Either way, he's not in jail. Nobody knows where he is right now. And the mother, um, again, nobody knows where she is. No justice. What a sad, sad story for Poppy. Comment. Tell me what you think.